views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello and thank you for joining us for our home, our haven, Safe Streets, a forum on preventing gun violence. I am Javier E. Gomez. Gun violence has become far too familiar in cities and communities across the nation. Recent mass shootings in Uvalde, Texas, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Buffalo, New York have made global headlines and reminded everyone of the need for solutions and action to end gun violence. Our forum today brings together family members of innocent victims of gun violence, along with leaders, advocates, and policymakers who are working toward innovative ways to bring about a better future embracing peace, safety, and empathy. Stay tuned for this important conversation from the Northeast Bronx YMCA, where Governor Hochul just signed a historic package of gun reform laws. Deaths by murder, homicide, unintentional circumstances, and defensive use of guns have increased from approximately 12,000 in 2014 to over 19,000 in 2020, according to the Gun Violence Archive. This year alone, 2022, there have been over 8,000 deaths nationwide so far due to murder, homicide, unintentional shootings, and defensive use of guns. There have been over 250 mass shootings across the nation, and the numbers just keep going up. Gun violence victims include Anthony Martin, a 27-year-old Bronx site who was fatally shot while sitting in a car in Soundview in August 2020, and Brandon Hendricks, the 17-year-old basketball star who was fatally shot while attending a barbecue in Morris Heights days after his high school graduation and the week before his 18th birthday in June 2020. And the list goes on. Uh, joining us for our first segment are Linda Kemp, grandmother of Anthony Martin, and Eve Hendricks, mother of Brandon Hendricks. We also have Bronx Borough President Vanessa L. Gibson and the Bronx District Attorney Darcel Clark. Welcome. Linda, let's start with you. In August uh, 2020, uh, your grandson Anthony Martin was fatally shot while sitting in the passenger seat of a car. He was rushed to Jacoby Hospital, but they couldn't save him. But then, in July of 2020, less than a year, 2021, less than a year after that, uh, your son was also shot. He uh, survived, but is facing now paralysis. Can you tell me a little bit about your loved ones? Well, um, starting with Anthony. Anthony was um, one of my older grandsons, um, basically the same age as my youngest daughter. <laughs> he was sitting in the car. Then what I was told that they were on their way to a baby shower and some young man just decided to get up and walk down the block in a very comfortable mode um, as if he was traveling to the store and looked in the car and decided to pull out a gun and shoot. Thankfully, um, I believe they said the gun jammed that they could see from camera, that the gun jammed and nobody else was hurt. And they were able to drive away and meet up with NYPD, who then helped get Anthony to the hospital to where he succumbed to his injuries. That. Um, it was very much so devastating for me because he was like one of my own birth children, being that him and my youngest daughter was at the same age. So they were together, often together, and I spent a lot of time with them. That affected our whole entire family. Um, gun violence does not just affect one person. It affects every individual that is related to them because we are, we are a family of love. It affects the community members because in the same area that Anthony was shot, you know, people were walking down the block. So it makes it unsafe for everyone. So it then affects every community member that violence touches. It's heartbreaking to know that another individual, another human being can think so little of another life that they would choose that option. I don't know if it's out of fear of one another. I don't know for any reason 
why someone would make a decision to take someone else's life, a life that they did not give, but so freely is willing to take. Then less than a year later, your family was hit again with gun violence. Yeah, and um, that right there with my baby son, Oh, it happened, it happened three days before his birthday. Um, I remember getting a call as it was taking place and he's calling me on the phone while he's laying down. He was sitting in his car talking with his friend. He said he thought he heard firecrackers and as he, he, he looked from his windows, he saw from a distance car coming down the block with guns hanging out the back and front windows. So his, um, his retort, I, I believe, was to try to get out of the car. Like, okay, it's coming, but it was already too late. Seconds matter, minutes matter. To get um, that call in the midst of what's happening to your child is devastating. I remember standing in the street panicking at one. Seemed like I think it was 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night trying to reach him and telling him that, you know, you're not gonna die. You're not gonna die. Um, it's, it's painstaking. It's painstaking. It's hurtful. Um, it, it, it brings you to the sense that you know that you're not the only one. I remember first meeting Eve and the first day that I met her and I embraced her and I held her because I felt the pain of a mother. I felt the pain of a mother during, she, she came to a, a community town hall that was given in my community and it wasn't but a few weeks after that, that I felt the pain of Anthony. And it, it brought it back. Um, and then moving forward, and we've been together on several occasions. And I remember that month before the Barrow president and I, um, she came to a walk that we had in our community. And when I spoke to the public, I said, my fear is, is that my child cannot come to visit because of the fear that our young men have of each other. And it's probably a, an imaginary fear, but just because it's there, it's not safe. Not knowing that a few weeks later that my son would be gunned down in the street. Thank you, Linda, for sharing that. Um... Amigos, it's very important that we have this conversation. It is a very difficult and painful conversation, but it is a conversation that we have to have so that we can get to real, tangible solutions and action to prevent uh, gun violence. Uh, Brandon uh, Hendricks was the promising basketball star who had just graduated James Monroe High School and was prepared to enter St. John's University. But in June 2020, he was an innocent bystander Bystander shot and killed at a barbecue. The case helped galvanize the city for peace and against gun violence. A street was later renamed in Brandon's memory. Uh, Eve, can you tell us a little bit more about Brandon? What was he like? Brandon is an amazing, amazing young man, full of life, energetic, smart, beautiful, pleasant, caring, giving, sharing. Uh, with a bright future, just someone that wants everyone to be happy, successful, want to give back to his community. Just an amazing all-around young man. Truly, truly an amazing young man. You were telling me off camera before we began filming that for people out there, um, a family member or someone being shot is just a name in the paper. A headline but you have to live with this every day of your life yes. can you tell me about that experience please well imagine when someone get killed and I can tell you by experience because I remember when junior got killed 
I cried, I was hurt. And I asked God, please don't let that happen to my child. But when I went home, my son was there. I could hug him, I could kiss him, I could tell him I love him. And a couple hours later, I'm still hurt for Junior, mother, but the feelings gradually fade because I can see my son. I'm with my son, I'm with my child. But then on June 29th, when I learned my son got shot, I understand the feeling doesn't go away. It will stay with you for a while, but it's not your child, so it fades. And then when someone else gets killed, that feeling will come back. But when it's yours, that feeling still linger. It stays, it's on to you. It plays with your emotion, your nerves, your life. It opens a window, it opens a door that you want no one to step in. Eve was telling me off camera before we began filming that she wanted to talk about this specifically because she feels that society has become desensitized to violence and that it all seems like a movie. But in her case, she says it's not like a movie, it's very real. Can you tell me a little bit about that sensation? I have to go home every day. I was telling the DA earlier and I tell our president that texts me and call me almost every day that when I go home now, it's hard to enter my, my, my home because my son is not inside physically. I used to go home and he would be there or I would expect him home. But now it's just, he's not there. It, it, it's, it's, it's real, you know, it's not, it's not a movie, it's, it's, it's real life. It's not gonna end with an happy ending or it's not a script, it's life. It's what we go through every day. Wake up 2 a.m. in the morning forgetting that he's dead. Running to his room, answering him because I hear him calling me. You know, calling his phone, I still call my son's phone because I'm expecting him to answer. It is not a movie, it's real life. It's something that people have to go through. We have to live with it. We have to live with expectation that's not there. Still go to the grocery shop, buy things that he likes. Still walk in the mall, want to pick things up for him. It's real life behind the headlines. Yes, it's not a movie. Borough President Gibson, um, as you have been working on solutions to prevent and stop as best possible gun violence. What can we say to Linda, Eve, and families that have uh, lost loved ones to gun violence? It's much more than our heart. So with these families and thoughts and prayers, we have to be about action. And these are families who will never be the same again. And it's painful when you hear them tell the story again and again, because we know that, you know, their lives will never be the same. But somehow as people of faith, we have to believe that God still has us here for a reason. And we can turn our pain into purpose and we can find strength in the middle of a storm. And when you hear the stories of mothers and fathers that have lost their children, sleepless nights, not being able to sleep at night, not being able to resume to normal life, it's really troubling. And I often say when the media and the cameras leave after we have the funeral and homegoing services, that's when the real work begins because we are still there helping these families on the ground with counseling, with rebuilding their lives, taking care of their other children and realizing and reminding them that God still has them, that there's still a purpose to live for. There's a reason to live for, not only to keep the life of your child alive, but to make sure that their death was not in vain, to celebrate the way they lived and not the tragic way they died. And we have been in the streets relentlessly every day, not just the month of June, but advocating, fighting for programs and safe spaces and community centers and recreation centers because we know young people need these spaces. They are necessities, not amenities. But we have to deal with the serious gun trafficking problem in this nation. This nation being built on violence and having this sensation with violence all over the place. But the fact that guns are coming in New York City in the Bronx and they're not manufactured in New York City or 
of the Bronx is a problem. And so we have to get the trafficking issue under control. But it's also the mindset of a young person wanting to use a gun to deal with conflict. I have beef with you, so I have to shoot you before you shoot me. I need to have a gun to protect myself. And that's what people tell us on the street. It's not safe in their neighborhood, or it's not safe on one side of a block versus another side, or one project versus another project. That is no way to live. None of us deserve this violence, and we're better than this. We're better together, but we have to realize that we have have to focus on the root causes of gun violence and the plague just like COVID-19 was a pandemic so is gun violence but we have to have the answers we can't just stand at vigils and mourn the loss of young people without having answers when parents reach out and say my young person is out of control I need them to get a job we need to offer that young person a job not just summer youth but all year round we need to get them into apprenticeship programs and vocation and CTE if they're not on the pathway to college we need to get them on a pathway to careers because the challenge and what we face in the Bronx the victims and the suspects look alike live in the same communities are usually the same age and we all live together so even as you see that crime take place that family the victim is still stuck in that neighborhood the suspects family is still stuck in that neighborhood and so at the end of the day we're all living together but we have to realize that there are programs we have to expand on yes we have to change laws and implement policies but we have to deal with two factors the gun trafficking and the mindset to use a weapon in the first place uh, thank you uh, board president um, district attorney clark um, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, solutions that your, your office is implementing. But before that, in terms of statistics, uh, what is happening in Bronx County? In Bronx County, we have, we have an uptick in violence. We unfortunately lead the city in every one of these horrible categories, shootings, shooting victims, and homicides. I tell you, as DA, I'm so tired, and I talk to the borough president about this all the time, I'm so tired of being first in everything bad and last in everything good. We are better than this, and we here in the Bronx know it. We deserve better, and we're going to get through this, but it's going to take everybody doing their part. So, I mean, I'm somebody that has to deal with the statistics every day, but it's more than statistics. These two women sitting next to me have become my friends. They're my family because when they hurt, I hurt. And I know their stories. I know when it happens. I'm calling them. And it's not only them. It's so many families. Every year, it's more and more families being added. You know, one of the programs that my, um, my office runs for the victims and survivors of homicide is something called the Angel Tree. We do it in, in December where people, survivors come together and we have angels that they put on a tree and they remember their loved ones. And you know, I've been the DA seven years and every year is more families. It hurts me because as I stand there, I know each one of these families when they come through, we have got to stop this. So, you know, knowing the uptick that we're having, there are things that we have to do. And that is getting to the root causes of the problem. You know, that, you know, poverty is one of so many things that lead people into the criminal justice system. We need to fix the D.A. should be the last resort. Mm -hmm. NYPD should be the last resort. We should not be the ones that has to solve this problem. We can do it in our own communities um, together. And um, that's what we have to do. Get more resources in our community. Mental health for people who are suffering COVID. Not only, you know, we lost lives to COVID, but the isolation that has caused has caused so much other violence. And, you know, when we talk about gun violence, it's not just, you know, somebody picking up a gun, gang members or whatever, people committing suicide. There's accidental death. There are people who are your unintended targets. We, I, I just know too many of those stories. And, you know, I'm left to, to prosecute individuals and when I do and I'm unapologetic about holding people accountable that caused this pain to two ladies like these who had family members who brought so much life and has so much to offer so I want to hold those people accountable but then when you look at also the ones that are committing the crimes we have to look at what got them there that brought them to the point that they had to do it so we have to fix all of it I mean recently we had an 11 year old girl murdered right Innocent bystander, she wasn't the intended target, 
But guess what? The intended target was 13, 13 years old. The shooter who has been arrested, allegedly, he 15 years old. And the person who was on the scooter driving that person that was a shooter, 18 years old. We are losing a generation of our children, yeah. black and brown. People talking about, oh, it's black and brown people committing the crime. It's black and brown people who are the victims of the crime as well. We're losing them either to the morgue or to prison. And everything in between, we can do better than this. And that's what we're working on each and every day. Talking a little bit about solutions, you uh, recently led a 5K walk against gun violence and the issue of ghost guns came up, the crackdown on ghost guns. Yeah. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about what is a ghost gun and about this crackdown and also any other uh, anti-violence initiatives that you might All have? Alright, so the ghost gun issue is really, really, really a, a pressing problem now. Before we had this iron pipeline, what happens is that like New York has some of the strictest gun laws in the country. And in this very building yesterday, I was here along uh, with the borough president where the governor signed 10 more bills that strengthen the gun laws that we already have. But like what she said, those guns are not manufactured here in the Bronx, but still they're getting here. People go down south, they can buy them in different places. The ghost gun makes that even worse because what they can do is order it online. What it, a ghost gun is a gun that you can buy in pieces. So part of it was already made, you buy another part, you put it together in your home and it makes a gun and it uses the same bullets that a regular gun uses. That you don't have to have a license to buy them. There's no serial numbers, there's no background checks. So that Forget about the iron pipeline now. You don't even need to leave. Just go online, order it, put it together in your home, and you have a gun. We've had three homicides already in this county where people used ghost guns. A 16-year-old girl walking home from school on a Friday afternoon. Where was she? She was in the right place at the right time. That person with that gun who was 17 years old, he, who's been arrested and accused, had a ghost gun. So that was put together, he had that. I don't know how he got it, but he had it. So we have to do something to stop these ghost guns now. You know, I'm, not only am I the district attorney of the Bronx, I'm also the co-chair of an organization called Prosecutors Against Gun Violence. It's a bipartisan group, prosecutors across this country who, of course, nobody is for gun violence. So we fight legislation, advocacy, whatever we can to bring up issues of gun violence. We wrote a letter to MasterCard and Visa asking them, don't let your card be used on these websites where people are buying these ghost guns. In the meantime, President Biden has instructed the Department of Justice and the laws have changed now that come August 24th, these ghost guns now will be illegal federally. Mm -hmm. So that means that you have to have a license to buy it, that all the pieces have to have serial numbers, that they have to have background checks. But that's not until August 24th. So between now and then, we've gone to the website. You know what it is? Hurry up. Get yours now. Guns, are, they're running out. So I actually even had a meeting with MasterCard after we wrote the letter to them. They responded to us, and we're trying to work on ways together to get them to not allow their card to be used. You know, we, we're trying to find some common ground. But in the meantime, this is something that has to be solved. So that's why ghost guns are so dangerous, because there's no way of checking them, and people are dying. This is very serious, because it also touches on the international community at all. You, have, you can have suppliers from all over the world, so enforcement is very tough. Yes. Now, uh, you mentioned, I, I, we were having a great conversation before we started filming. Um, you were having a conversation about the buyback program. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Yeah, so what we do as district attorneys working with the NYPD, we have gun buyback program. It's an amnesty program where people can turn in guns and get money. You know, we, we usually give a $200 gift card. Over the years, recently, we've had to enhance it because $200, you know, it's not enough. I mean, this past December, we had one here in the Bronx, and it was increased to $500 because a community-based organization came forward and, uh, and gave us uh, the money. 
So um, we had that. We give away iPads and people turning their guns, no questions asked, no background. They don't have to give their information. NYPD takes the guns, make sure they're operable and they receive that money. When we're advertising it, I go out in the street, I hit the streets and ask people, please turn your guns in. And I have had conversations with members of the community say, DA Clark, I know you mean well, but it's dangerous out here. This is not a time for me to turn my gun in. I, that, that, that's hurtful. That means that that person, you know, is either going to use that gun one day or somebody's going to use a gun against them because they have one. We have to do better to get the guns out of the hands of people. Uh, Governor Hochul uh, recently signed 10 new uh, bills, as uh, you mentioned as well, uh, for gun law reform. Some of the uh, changes include raising the minimum age to 21. Uh, for bu buying uh, certain rifles, uh, barriers uh, for bullet, uh, the purchase of bulletproof vests and body armor, uh, accountability for social media companies, also making uh, the threat of mass harm a punishable offense, and also uh, certain punishments for the possession of high-capacity ammunition, among other things. Do you think these this, this are good, these go far enough, or, or we still need to close some loopholes in terms of the law? Well, first I want to applaud Governor Kathy Hochul and, of course, Assembly Speaker Carl Hasty and Senate Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins and the members of the State Senate and State Assembly as they convene this 2022 legislative session, and certainly uh, on the backdrop of the horrific uh, mass shooting in Buffalo New York and Uvalde, Texas, New York was the first to come out with a comprehensive package of legislation related to gun safety and public safety. And I think New York has always been a leader. I served as a member of the State Assembly at the time when we passed the New York SAFE Act a few years ago. And I think New York can and always will lead by example. And yes, it will have an impact for us New Yorkers. But of course, we know that we really need federal action because in order to stop the weapons from coming out of New York State and, and making sure that we deal with gun trafficking, we need our legislators in Congress, along with President Biden, to act. We need to hold the NRA accountable and gun manufacturers accountable and make sure that we regulate ghost guns. It is unacceptable in America that we are seeing more mass shootings across this country. And now the number one killer of children is gun violence in this country. And that was never the case. And so to me, this is a call to action and a call to attention. Our children are dying before our eyes and our families are broken and bruised forever. This, these are things that we never get back when you lose a child as a mother, as a father, mourning the loss of 16-year-old Angie Yambo, 11-year-old Kiara Tay. And we call these names out because guess what? Every time we turn around, there's another name added to a long list. This is the most unpopular club that no one ever wants to be a part of. And somehow these mothers have found strength from each other, from us, working together and waking up every day knowing that God still has their back, even though their pain is permanent. So I do believe that the legislation that's now state law will make an impact for us in New York, and I'm grateful for that because you should not be 18 years old on your birthday buying an AR-15 and having body armor. That makes no sense, and so I feel that we were able to address a lot of loopholes with this package of bills, and I think New York is setting the precedent for others to follow, but also we need federal interaction. And I want, yeah, I want to add something to that. You know, there's a lot of attention to the mass shootings, and rightfully so, because it is so tragic that so many, you know, people lose their lives all at one time, senselessly, like in Buffalo and Uvalde. But you know what? I'm in the Bronx, and you know what? People are losing their lives every day here, too. And it may not be a whole lot of people at one time, but we have two and three murders per day sometimes. So that's mass murder for us as well. So this, this is something that should not only cause attention because there's a, you know, a, a mass shooting, but we need to be conscientious of the fact that people are losing their lives one day at a time here in our communities every day. And we don't get the, you know, it doesn't get the notoriety or it's not on the big news um, uh, or cast and things like that, but we feel it just as well and we need everybody to be able to feel the pain that we feel because you know what i live in this bronx 
And when I sit on my porch and I hear gunshots, and my neighbors tell me they heard gunshots, guess what? I hear them too. So we are all in this together. Regardless of who you are, this is about life in this borough, and we need to do more to make it safer. Uh, you, as well as the borough president, stressed in the beginning of the conversation that uh, addressing root causes is vital here. You mentioned poverty, uh, gangs, um, you mentioned trafficking, uh, t jobs, employment, opportunity, education. Um, it seems to be so multi-level and so broad that it seems overwhelming and it seems to be like a broken ecosystem. Is there a way to, to blend this together and, and, and find solutions? How can we do this? As a city, we can do it. The leadership that we have, we have a mayor, who is interested in bringing this together. We have a governor, obviously, who is, you know, signing legislation. We, we have a speaker, a majority leader, so many elected officials, but also the clergy and business leaders and educators and members of the community. We all play a part in this. We need a strategic plan for this city, but we can only do it if everybody is at the table. Everybody has to be at the table. Everybody needs to know their role, and everybody has to do their part to contribute it. If we all know what each other is doing, we're able to support each other. Like I said, it is a broken eco ecosystem because, you know, if the schools were better, we got to go into the schools then and train them about anti-violence, you know, solutions. You know, we talk about bullying. That's one thing. But we need to talk to these young people about what can we do to get you not to pick up a gun? What are the alternatives to shooting? I've talked to them. I sit down and say, this is New York City, the most well-resourced city in the world. I'm the Bronx District Attorney. I have networks and access to a lot of resources. Tell me, what do I have to do to get you to put that gun down and pick up a book, pick up the Bible, pick up the Quran, pick up a, a computer or a tool? If you tell me what you need, I'm gonna get it for you. And that's the type of collaboration we need as a city. We're all stakeholders in the room together to get those answers. But we also have to speak to the young people because we can sit in rooms planning, oh, they need this, they need that. But we need them in the room for them to tell us what it is that they need because we might think we know what they need, but they know better than we do. And, and, that's, and that's the approach that I'm trying to take now. And to talk to the parents too. Because a lot of times, you know, we're tough, we got tough laws and things like that where, you know, there's going to be punishment for young people for making mistakes or bad judgment. And, you know, there has to be accountability for that. There are consequences for you making decisions, whether you meant to, whether it's accidental, whether it was poor judgment, whatever it is. But I also think about those parents. And I've talked to them, and, you know, I've talked tough, you know, because I want people to know that we... We, we mean business about this. But some of the parents have come and said, I understand your message, but who's going to help me? I'm trying to make sure that my son comes home every night. I need resources. I need a better job. I need a better neighborhood to live in, you know. Um, we need to reach out to them and give them the resources as well so they can bring up their families. If, if a family is safe and well-resourced, then our city and borough is well-resourced and safe. Linda and Eve, in terms of solutions, uh, how do you see it? Um, well, a lot of what um, DA Clark just mentioned is vital, that that wraparound service also to help the parent in order to help the child because you never know what's needed in the household. But I think besides that, we need to pay attention to what else is going on in our communities. When you have stores that are opening up, that are selling our underage children vape pens and, and different type of drugs that these kids are on that are unregulated, you don't know what are in these things. And sometimes I think about the mindset of our children and how could they think that it is okay to do the things that they're doing, picking up guns and shooting. But then you have to think about what they're putting into their bodies as well, internally. And our community is saturated with these stores. I know it's not, this is not the subject here, but when I think about when I can look and I can see hookah pipes and I see different type of mechanisms that our babies are smoking and utilizing, we don't know what effects that have on their brain and their frame of thought 
that makes them put in a situation that it's okay to do what they're doing. So I think there also needs to be a forum sort of outside of just basically saying gun violence, but for the members of the community to discuss with our leadership what is going on in our communities that could be the substance that's bringing all this crime in our areas. And as well, sometimes that table that is full of degrees in teachers and those that sometimes in our community, and I wanna say I've been in my community over 50 years, so I've seen development, redevelopment, restructure, lines crossed, okay? And I've seen the lines divided. It's time for us to come together as a whole and bring everybody to the table to discuss what's going on in our community. And the gun violence is prevalent. The mindset of our children is prevalent because you can give all of these packages and give all of these services. And we have great services in our community. The borough president have put, um, as councilwoman, has put computers and put all kinds of things into the schools and community schools and all of these resources, but something is missing. And I think more people need to be at the table in those conversations that are being had to help stop the violence in our community because it's hurting everybody, right. everybody. Eve, in terms of solutions, what, what do you see that, that, that you might, what, what do you think you need that you are not seeing? How, how, how can we address this to prevent gun violence as someone who's lived it? Well, I think if you're caught with a gun, you need to be punished. It could be three months, six months, a year. You need to be arrested and stay in jail. If you are an hardcore criminal murderer, you need to be punished. You need to, be, you need to stay in jail. You don't need to be out on the street. You don't need bail because most of the time you're repeaters. We need more police in our neighborhood, especially the neighborhood who have um, more crimes that are, uh, are a card. We need um, to encourage parents, to encourage their children to take advantage of the programs that um, the borough president and the DA, you know, put together. Encourage your kids. We need more mentors in our community. We need more school in our schools. We need more safety officers in our school. We need more checkpoints. We need better checkpoint because like they said, we do not make guns here in New York City. So how do we get guns here? How do, how do they get here? Why? And we need to, to get an answer. Why are our children being killed? Why? Because to me now it's like a business. Mm -hmm. So we need to get to the root of that. Why? Why? So mental illness, we need to address that. It's, it's just a lot of things. But most of all, we need to come together as a community, police our own community. So as I hear you all talk, it seems to be that we need a thorough, comprehensive 360 uh, degrees, degrees approach yes. to this. Yes. What can people do, uh, District Attorney and Borough President, what can people do uh, in their own lives to help prevent gun violence? Well, I think, you know, you have to be aware of your surroundings. You need to be aware of what is going on in your neighborhood. You know, if you see something, you need to say something. I mean, that's, that's the biggest thing. This, this no snitch culture is not healthy and it's not safe because you are allowing those people to hold you hostage in your own community. And, and I know it's, it's scary. But we have so many courageous people that are coming forward anyway because they care about their lives, they care about the lives of their neighbors, and they care that these people who are bringing the harm to the community be held accountable. So we need people to report. We need people to cooperate with the DA and the police. And I know that's not always easy and it's not always popular, but that's the safest way. Look, I started a witness um, safety program for people who are courageous enough come forward. We have advocates to work with them to bring them back and forth to court. We relocate people so that they could be safe, so they can continue to, you know, be the witnesses that we need. Uh, we have therapists to help them. Because a lot of this is unaddressed trauma. 
as these things happen in our community, everybody's becoming traumatized. So you talk about desensitizing, you know, people just hear gunshots like, oh, well, maybe it's, maybe it's firecrackers, maybe it's not, and nobody does anything, that continues to make the community unsafe. So we need to send, you know, we, the mental health is real for those people to be able to deal with that. So, you know, those are the resources that we need to, you know, continue to, to put into our communities to help people be safe. So we need people to report stuff. We need them to take advantage of the programming, you know, that we are doing. But most importantly, I want to hear their ideas. You know, you are the solution. You know, don't look for others to be the solution. You're the solution. Tell me what that solution is. Let's work together to bring it about. So it takes a whole community to participate. It takes a whole community. And first, let me just say that this violence is not normal, and we should never treat it as such. We cannot live in a world where violence is surrounding us. We should be able to walk our streets, go to school, go to work, have our children in the park and playground, and be safe. And because it's happening so randomly, no one feels safe. Everyone in our community is a credible messenger, no matter the title you have in front of your name. It is your responsibility if you know someone in your community that is possessing weapons, a victim of a crime, someone who is destroying your community, you have an obligation to speak on that. But we also have an obligation to keep you safe if you come forward, because a lot of people are hesitant to come forward because they don't feel safe. They don't feel their identity will be protected. The anti-gun violence organizations, the crisis management system, clergy, faith leaders, CBOs, so many people with many titles, we all have a collective responsibility. And when it happens to one of us, it happens to all of us. And so we all take this very personal when a child or an elder is shot or assaulted in our communities, we take this very personal. And what Mayor Adams is trying to do, we're about to pass a budget in the city of New York in the next few weeks, 100,000 summer youth jobs, opening up beacon programs, cornerstone programs, summer camp, Saturday night lights programs, opening up spaces like the YMCA's and Kipps Bay's and community centers and rec centers. That's what our young people need. But we also need jobs too, mm -hmm. occupying the blocks, occupying the corners, talking to young people. You see a group of guys on the corner. Hey guys, let me tell you about this program. Anybody want a job? You want to work? You want to mentor? You know, giving our young people those options. Like the worst thing we can do is limit their choices. We have to open up these school buildings, these community centers, these rec centers and NYCHA and every other space and make sure that they're available. Because the reality is this is happening all across the Bronx, even in neighborhoods that historically did not experience high rates of crime. And so everyone has to take responsibility. Yes, people need to be held accountable, but the one message I say to Bronxites, a majority of us are law-abiding, tax-paying, homeowners, residents, renters, business owners, entrepreneurs, and we care. The few bad apples is a minority compared to the majority of us. Why do we allow the minority to determine and dictate the way we live our lives? So there are more of us than there are of them. That means that the answer is us. We cannot accept a neighborhood and a community where we are surrounded by violence and we're looking over our shoulder everywhere we go. That is no way to live. We are the answer. We will get through this as a borough and as a city. Yes, it takes time. There's no perfect answer, but guess what? All of us are a part of the answer. There seems to be that we need a series of small steps Absolutely. as we move closer toward the ultimate goal. So what would be the next steps given, given where things are at the moment of this filming? Parents, you know, if they know that their, their child children are in gangs with guns up to no good, they should do something about it. Report them. Go to the police. You know, if they don't want to be known, send someone because that can also be a good help. That can, you are saving someone's lives that way and your child's lives. So that, all, that is also a, a big way of solving. That is a oh, good man. message because, I, you know, I said that out when I talked about those young people that were all involved in um, Kiara Tay's uh, murder, you know, I, I put a pitch out to them because at the time she was killed, we didn't have anybody under arrest. I said, turn yourself in because it's going to be safer because they're opposing gangs. And, and these are gangs that last year we had the same scenario. We had a 13-year-old kill, then a 16-year-old and a 19-year-old. Same thing, same scenario. So here we are again. I want to stop that. I said, turn yourself in is safer because either your opposition is going to find you mm -hmm. 
or the police is going to find you or somebody else is going to get you. The safest way is to turn yourself in. I told the parents, turn your child in. Yeah. It's safer for them to turn themselves in and let the system work. We're, trying to, we're making it as fair as possible now. And they will get their day in court and they'll have lawyers. And we have enough there. It's better than running the streets looking over your shoulder wondering if somebody else is going to shoot you because you shot somebody else. One parent chose not to start, turn a son in and hit him, but we found him. And the other parent turned her son in to my office with a lawyer. So I know the message is getting through. This is how we're going to get through this. As a community, even if you do something wrong, take some responsibility. That's what's going to keep you safe rather than the alternative, thinking you're going to run and get away with it because you're not. Can I ask you a question? Is there, is there parent accountability? You know, everybody has been asking me that lately, especially for the one parent who hit her son in a hotel room. Yeah. You know, and you know what? I'm looking into it, you know. But again, uh, this is about compliance. This is about being safe. Like, I don't want to prosecute a parent. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if something is missing in her life, she, we need to make sure that that parent get the resources so that she didn't choose that alternative. Yeah. But looking at, you know, and social media plays a big role in this yeah. because a lot of this is driven by these videos and yeah. social media, music. some of the music, and that's a whole no, different, yeah. we can have a whole nother segment on that. And I would love to do that. But you know, when you look at the social media of some of these individuals involved, you see them posing with guns mm -hmm. and parents mm -hmm. in the picture, okay? So that tells me, how could I be angry at that young person when their parent is in the video with them, encouraging that? So we got a lot of work to do. It's intergenerational poverty. Yeah. If you know better, you do better. And parents have to be taught. And I think when you look at the generation of parents that we have today, sometimes they were lacking parental guidance and love in their own lives. And that's transcending now to their own children. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we need to do more to support parents. We always talk about parenting classes and helping parents. But I also think for those parents that do reach out and seek help, they also need to have answers. We need to give them resources and programs. I reach out as a parent and say, my child is out of control. They're coming home with expensive, you know, clothing and things that I know I didn't buy and they don't have a job. Something's wrong. There were red flags that parents see. Now you either choose to embrace it or you ignore it. But if you ignore it, it's going to filter and it's going to fester and get worse and worse. You have to have eyes and know what your kids are doing. You have a lot of parents that monitor their kids' social media and they stay on them, but they're doing that to keep keep them alive and giving them an outlet to say, if something is happening, let me know if you're a victim of, of bullying, you have a problem with someone in school. Because a lot of these beefs start out very trivial. It can be over a girl or a boy or money, and then it turns into something much more because it wasn't addressed at the onset. And so we need to support those parents. When they reach out, we need to have answers for them. But this is a cycle. Intergenerational poverty is real, from grandparents to parents and now grandchildren. And we have to stop that cycle in its tracks and offer programs and resources for parents and their families. In terms of services and resources for the relatives of victims, um, what exists out there already and or what is needed if, if anyone can reply you know there are some organizations that help is 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 um, victims so for survivors you know there's there's always um, help my office does a lot of this work I mean, and we've known it for families who crimes have happened 30 years ago 20 years ago we still service them no matter what whether there's an arrest or not so we do that but there's, you know, a lot of advocacy groups out there, Safe Horizons, you know, Sanctuary for Families, you know, different, you know, wraparound services, things like that, the, you know, uh, domestic violence organizations. There's a, there are things out there, but I think that we're, we're coming up with something new as we see this gun. We need something for gun violence. The Cure Violence groups have that access as well, that they are now starting to service those families to make sure they get what they need so that they can help that young people or help that whole family out of the cycle of violence. So it's out there. I think we need to organize it more and we need to advertise it more so they'll know there's a place to go. And it's, it, it's an option to go into the police because not everybody's gonna go to the police. You know, we have an issue with trust between the community and the police, but that doesn't mean that because you don't trust the police that you don't try to get 
resources somewhere else. So that's something that we need to work on. And in another new approach, Mayor Adams just announced a few weeks ago that he was promoting uh, A.T. Mitchell from Man Up in East New York, Brooklyn, as the new gun violence prevention czar. And every single agency that overlaps in gun violence, DOE, as well as DYCD and a number of other agencies, Working with all five deputy mayors, we're going to make sure that in each agency we have gun violence prevention programs and resources. So the question is, how do we translate that from City Hall to the Bronx, into households and into schools and community centers working with non-for-profits? So a lot of these things are very new, but very real in terms of the impact that we want to have. We're gearing up for a very hot summer. July and August with kids being out of school, we worry, but we're going to stay ready because if we stay ready, we don't have to get ready and we know what we anticipate. So let us start now in June, Gun Violence Awareness Month, and get these programs up and running, get them out to schools, get them out to parents, get them out to community groups so that parents can be aware of what's happening and you know implement a lot of these programs and get their kids into these programs. I think it would be great. In the final seconds that I have, uh, Linda and Eve, how would you um, want the legacy of your loved ones to be honored? I, I, I want their legacy to be honored in love, in love of community, in love of self. Um, as painful as it is, I'm always grateful to God for the opportunities and the moments that I've had with them. Um, I take solace in, in knowing that there, there's hope. I take solace in hope and hope that the generations that follow will see a better light and want to live. Eve. Remember his name, Brendan Hendricks. Remember what he, st what he stood for, for honesty, for love, to care. And remember, if it happened to him, it can happen to anyone. Just, just remember his name. Thank you all for this powerful conversation. Thank Very you. appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, friends, stay tuned for part two of our Gun Violence Prevention Forum to find out more about innovative actions and the people working to safeguard our communities.